Bibliophiles of the internet, today I thought it'd be fun to show you some books that are new to my shelves. It's a mini book haul of sorts. I get some cool book mail now and again, mostly stuff I get for myself, and I thought it'd be cool to share a little bit of that and also maybe to put some new titles on your radar as well because book hauls are definitely a big way that I discover new books for myself. With that said, let's get right into it. The first book I'm going to show you today is the special UK edition of You Made a Fool of Death with Your Beauty by Akweke Amezi. Folks in the romance corner of the book internet know all about the MILF book, which I may or may not be talking about later, but a lot of romance readers affectionately refer to this as the DILF book, and I sincerely hope that that is factual correct. Anyways, this story is about finding love after loss. The main character, Faye, lost her soulmate in a tragic accident five years before the story begins. She's just now getting herself back together, working as an artist, living with her best friend, who believes that it's time for her to finally get herself back into the dating scene. So she does, and she ends up going on all these incredible adventures and dating a really great guy. But she might actually end up sabotaging their relationship before it begins because she finds herself drawn to someone else who is definitely off-limits. I've heard a lot of great things about this. Yes, there have been some polarizing reviews, a lot of very passionate discourse about these characters and the choices they make, but I'm still really excited to eventually read it for myself. As I mentioned, this is a special edition that I pre-ordered from the Portobello Bookshop, and it has these beautifully sprayed edges that match the spine and matching end papers as well, and a pink ribbon bookmark. Next, I have another UK edition, and that is If You Still Recognize Me by Cynthia So. I'm pretty sure I heard about this one on TikTok when Heartstopper first came out, and every book talk author and creator was pitching everything as Heartstopper meets other piece of media. I don't know whether that's actually true for the story, but I'm pretty sure I heard about it in one of those videos. It's written by a queer Chinese-British author, and it's a queer YA contemporary romance about Elsie who has a crush on Ada who lives an entire ocean away, which means they've never actually met. Right when Elsie is gearing up to tell Ada how she really feels, her long-lost best friend comes back into her life and they start to reconnect. So now after an incredible summer of rebuilding relationships and discovering new ones, Elsie will have a very big choice to make. I've heard stellar things about this from so many close friends and reviewers. I feel like this could definitely become one of my new all-time favorite books. I just have to find the right time to read it. Also, I'm pretty sure the US cover and release date were recently announced, and I think that it's going to come out stateside in spring 2023. Then we have A Far Wilder Magic by Alison Saft. This is a YA fantasy romance of sorts that revolves around this magical hunt. The main character, Margaret, spots this legendary Hala, which is the last living mythical creature of its kind that's followed ceremoniously in the annual Half Moon Hunt. Anyone who captures this creature, which is pretty much impossible, is going to receive incredible fame and fortune, and Margaret is convinced that if she succeeds in the hunt, it is going to somehow persuade her wayward mother to finally come home. However, anyone officially joining the hunt is required to do so in a team of two, and while Margaret is by far the most talented sharpshooter in town, she finds herself in desperate need of an alchemist. She ends up with an alchemical apprentice named Wes, who's come to town seeking the mentorship of Margaret's mother. So they become an unlikely duo of sorts and end up discovering some dark magic that could win them the hunt if they can actually survive long enough to use it. This one I was influenced on. I was influenced by Hannah from A Clockwork Reader, who was posting about this book in her stories, and she said it was basically officially published Roy I Fan fiction. And if you know even a little bit about me, you know that Roy I is a foundational ship in my experience. I credit Roy I with the fact that I'm weak for a good bodyguard romance, even though this is not that, but I have found interviews where the author has explicitly talked about being inspired by Full Metal Alchemist, and it's definitely not hard to find those pieces in this story. Sharpshooter, alchemist, you do the math. Listen, I don't need to know anything else. I don't even need the book to be good. I just need it to be injected into my veins and my consciousness this second. Then I pre-ordered Valentina Salazar is Not a Monster Hunter by Zoraida Cordova. This is her latest middle grade book. It's pitched as Salangabi meets Supernatural, and it's about a Latin main character, Valentina, who comes from a family of protectors who are tasked with guarding the human world from paranormal, magical creatures. But when her father is tragically killed during one of their missions, her mom decides it's time for the entire family to hang up the business and move across the country, where she's going to enroll Valentina and her siblings in a real school for the first time in their lives. But when Valentina sees a mythical egg in a viral video, she knows it's up to her family to retrieve the egg before it hatches. But they have to move quickly because the egg is also being tracked by some very notoriously dangerous monster hunters. I feel like Zoraida is one of those authors who gets better and better with every book she writes. I've been wanting to try her middle grade for quite some time, and I think this one's going to be really, really fun. It might also be a great pick for spooky season as well. Then Penguin Teen very kindly sent me a review copy of A Scatter of Light by Melinda Lowe, which is actually already out in the world by the time you see 
see this. This is a very distant, very loose companion to Last Night at the Telegraph Club, which you should all know is one of my favorite, favorite books. This also takes place in the Bay Area in the early 2000s, I believe, when the Supreme Court was first legalizing gay marriage on a nationwide basis. It's about a Chinese-American teenager named Arya who's looking forward to having one last great summer with her friends before college. But after a graduation party gone terribly wrong, her parents basically exile her to California to live with her grandmother, Joan, who's also an artist. Arya expects to be bored out of her mind all summer, but that's before she meets her grandmother's gardener, Steph Nichols. And this is a girl who's making Arya question everything she thought she knew about herself, and who could single-handedly transform Arya's summer from ordinary to extraordinary in just a few whirlwind weeks. Like I said, I absolutely love Last Night at the Telegraph Club. The way Melinda Lowe was able to celebrate and honor queer history in that story was transcendent, and I expect nothing less from this. Even though the backdrop of this story is more contemporary, I think this time period could still be considered queer history nonetheless, and I'm really excited to see what she does with it. This book has also gotten really great reviews so far. Obviously, I was hoping to read it before it came out, but I know that no matter when I get to it, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. Then we have another book I pre-ordered, and that is One one Dark Window by Rachel Gillig. This came out from Orbit very recently. It's supposed to be like a dark gothic fantasy following Elspeth, who lives in this misty, dangerous kingdom that's very unsafe. So she actually keeps a monster trapped inside her who protects her and knows all her fears and secrets. When she meets a mysterious highwayman in the forest, she finds herself thrust into this quest to free the kingdom from the dark magic binding it. And this highwayman, unbeknownst to her, is actually the king's nephew who's been accused of high treason. So as she and this highwayman journey around the kingdom to collect these 12 keys, they need to break the curse. They start falling for each other, and Elspeth also begins realizing that the monster in her head is very close to taking her over entirely, and she may not be able to stop him once he does. Listen, we got gothic elements, a cursed kingdom, forbidden romance, secret royals, and a demon trapped in the mind of the main character. Any of these things separately would be enough to pique my interest, but putting them together is, frankly, almost too many good things. This one was on my radar for a very long time before I hit the pre-order button, and I have a very good feeling about it. If it doesn't deliver, which honestly would be very hard to do with just those base elements alone, I will be absolutely crushed. Next, we have one of my most anticipated releases of 2022, and that is A Minor Chorus by Billy Ray Belcourt. I am so excited to have this in my hands, you have no idea. Billy Ray Belcourt is a queer indigenous poet, writer, and scholar from the Driftpile Cree Nation. This is his first ever novel, his first ever piece of fiction, I believe, and let me just say, I could not hit pre-order fast enough. Billy Ray Belcourt's memoir, A History of My Brief Body, is one of the best nonfiction books I've ever read, so I have absolute unwavering faith in a minor chorus. I feel like this is going to be one of those uniquely positioned stories that defy genre or classification. It seems like it's almost bordering metafiction because it's about this unnamed indigenous doctoral student who takes a break from writing his dissertation to try and finish his first book. He's kind of caught between life on his reservation and this newfound world of academia, and taking this break allows him to connect and reconnect with all these different people in his community and to reflect on the death of his cousin Jack. I literally don't need to know anything else. This book could have come without a cover design, without a synopsis, without blurbs. It could have been a random sheaf of papers just stapled together with Billy Ray Belcourt's name on it, and I still would have gotten it for myself. Billy Ray Belcourt is an amazing artist. I know he's very close with Joshua Whitehead as well, and their work is very much in conversation with each other more often than not. I will be reading this in November. I don't know a lot about my life and what's happening in it, but I can tell you with absolute certainty that I will be reading this. Next, as I hinted at earlier, St. Martin's Griffin very generously sent me a finished copy of the infamous MILF book, Mistakes Were Made by Meryl Wilsner. I've been waiting on this one a very long time. It's like a sexy, steamy sapphic adult rom-com about a college senior who unknowingly hooks up with her best friend's mom. Cassie is just trying to escape her school's family weekend when she goes to an off-campus bar to drown her sorrows a little bit, flirt with some strangers, maybe go home with one of them, and she does. But then when she meets back up with her best friend the next morning, her friend wants to introduce Cassie to her mom, who's the hot older woman that she just slept with. They pretend not to know each other, trying to put this behind them, but they also find out that they get along just as well in broad daylight as they did the night before, and they quickly realize that something real might be growing between them, but at what cost? 
I've heard so many great things about this one from so many early reviewers. I'm just ready for some messy, smutty fun between consenting adults. It almost sounds like a comedy of errors. It's definitely a disaster in the making, and I'm very curious to see how these characters are going to navigate this sticky situation and come out on the other side in their happy ending that is guaranteed in all romances. Also, shout out again to St. Martin's Griffin because they sent along this really great bookmark, and it says, the good news, she likes someone. The bad news, it's her best friend's mom. And they also sent along this signed book plate as well. On a different note, I want to talk about a recent indie published book that I'm very excited about, and that is The Name Bearer by Natalia Hernandez. As I said, it's an indie published queer indigenous Latina high fantasy story that's kind of a take on the chosen one trope. The main character is known as the name bearer, and her whole purpose in life is to deliver the name of the next monarch. But when a child is finally born and the main character takes them to the Flowers of Prophecy, the flowers refuse to name the child and proclaim that another has been born who is more worthy, and if that person is brought to them, it would usher in an era of peace. Having failed in her duties for the first time, the name bearer is considered a traitor to the crown, and she finds herself hiding among this elite sect of warriors who are helping her prepare to clear her name, save the kingdom, and find this unnamed prince. I also love the tagline on the back, which says, a story of magia, warrior women, found family, and love, and not accepting who you're told to be, but embracing who you are destined to become. Like a lot of people, I heard about this book from Natalia herself, especially on TikTok. I also had the honor of meeting her in person when we were both in San Diego for the Sun Bear Trials tour stop. We basically hung out in the same group the entire time, and she is just wonderful in so many ways. There's so much about this story that appeals to me, and also it's still incredibly rare to find Latina-inspired high fantasy stories, especially those centering indigenous Latina characters and world building, so I've had my eye on this one for quite some time, and I definitely have high hopes. Then Pantheon Books very kindly sent me an arc of Chain Gang All-Stars by Nane Kwan this is from the author of Friday Black, which is a very striking collection of short stories that's been very highly praised and on my TBR for several years at this point, but when I heard he was coming out with his first full-length novel, I was super, super stoked. This is like a mixture of sci-fi and dystopia, almost Squid Game-esque, about this super controversial profit-raising program that's become part of America's private prison system, which pits prisoners against each other in a gladiator-style competition to win their freedom. I feel like it goes without saying, but this story is setting itself up to comment on the corruption of the private prison system, the systemic racism that those systems not only perpetuate but depend on, and the extremes of what can happen when that is put on a collision course with capitalism itself. I think it's going to be a really gritty, sharp, unforgiving, in-your-face kind of story, which is what I often hear about Friday Black as well. I don't really know what to expect in truth, but I think it's going to be great, and this one comes out in April 2023. Lastly, I want to talk about a book I don't even have in my hands yet. It's supposed to come tomorrow or maybe later today, but I just cannot wait to talk about it, and that is my pre-order of Nikhil Out Loud by Malik Pancholi. Malik Pancholi is a queer Indian American actor and comedian. He is the author of The Best At It, which is by far one of my favorite queer stories ever, and when I heard he was writing another queer middle grade story, I was so, so happy. This one's about a gay Indian American boy, Nikhil Shah, who's actually a voice actor for an animated series called Raj Reddy in Space. When his mom moves them to a small town in Ohio so they can help take care of his ailing grandfather, Nikhil feels just as out of orbit as his character does. He finds himself in a new school trying to make new friends, and he's also been cast in the school musical as well, but he's terrified everyone's gonna think he's a fraud when they find out he has terrible stage fright. Suddenly, the conservative parents in this small town also recognize him as an out gay actor, and they start demanding that he gets pulled from the show. As if that and his grandfather's sickness wasn't enough, his voice also starts cracking, and he begins fearing that his voice acting days might be over much sooner than he thinks. So the story is really about him navigating all those really complicated things and realizing that this serial show we call life doesn't always wrap up neatly between commercial breaks. If there's anyone I trust to write this story, it's Malik Pencholi. I will say this, a lot of celebrities write books who do not need to write books, who do not produce very good books or even very needed books. Malik is not one of those people. He is so incredibly talented, he has such a needed voice and narrative perspective, he has the uncanny ability to write his way through multiple complex ideas at once, but in a way that's really relatable and enjoyable for younger audiences. Like, I have no stake in this man's acting career, but I will read read anything he writes. This is basically me once again pleading with all my fellow middle grade readers to please read The Best At It. If that story is anything to judge by, then I think there's a very strong chance that this could be another five-star book. So those are just a few highlights, just a handful of books that I've acquired in recent months. If you've read any of them yourself, I would love to hear what you thought, so drop a comment down below or let me know which one you think I should read first. But that's everything I had to share with you for today. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, educate yourself, be kind to yourself, take care of yourself, and I will catch you on the flip side of the page.